Now, tonight, I believe I said that we would be looking at the intertestamental period twice. We're going to be looking at it twice tonight. I had it planned to do this way because we have been studying the lands of the diaspora, parts one and two, and I want to finish that tonight, lands of the diaspora, part three, and then we'll go on into something else. That way we're not stuck on one night looking at two parts, one and two or two and three of lands of the diaspora, which might, I don't know, might bore you a little bit or something. Let's get our map back up here again. Just, we don't, we're not too concerned now with North Africa, so I'll give us a, a straight sea coast there. Lands of the diaspora. Uh, part three. Remember that we're looking now at the Western world under Roman numeral two. We'll be down on letter C. We're working our way counterclockwise. I didn't really give myself enough space there, but that's all right, I guess. Uh, we've talked about uh, Cyrene already down here, and we've talked about Egypt, and particularly Alexandria here. We're just we're trying to discover just exactly where all of these Jews are. This is a great diaspora, and just exactly where are these Jews in? I'll make Greece a little bit smaller so I can have Asia Minor just for that. Scattered because of their sin. Scattered, we're seeing very literally, uh, for the world of their day to the four corners of the world. They're certainly not just um, scattered over in the eastern world, over in the Levant, but they're scattered all over the Mediterranean world. And so working our way around, of course, we skip Palestine here because they wouldn't be scattered, those that are living here. We come, if I could if you'll allow me to work a C in right there, we come to Syria. We're going to work our way counterclockwise all the way around over here to Spain and Portugal. Syria. Now you may recall from earlier studies in the intertestamental period class that the Roman world divided up into provinces, some of them senatorial, some of them imperial. Whenever Augustus comes to the throne, then all provinces that become such after the time of his coming to the throne are immediately incorporated into the empire as imperial provinces because that means he has control of them versus the Roman Senate. And so the senatorial ones are, are on the gain. They're on the, the imperial ones are on the gain during this period in history. You may remember that Judea was actually not a province itself. You may not remember this. It's been a, some time ago. But Judea was actually not a province in the Roman Empire. Syria was the province in the Roman Empire. And Judea was just a part of that. I remember Judea was really controlled officially by the legate that lived up in Syria, uh, up in Antioch, although she had her own procurators or prefects that governed locally there. So when we're talking about the Jews being scattered here, although we're certainly talking about earlier than the time of the Roman Empire, whenever the Roman Empire does come on the scene, then the Jews are scattered um, really into just um, their mother northern uh, province because Judea is really not a province itself. It's just incorporated into Syria and it's counted as part of Syria. Now as with the 1 Kings 14 account of Shishak, that incident we studied last time, of a very early Jewish presence in Egypt. The same may have been true with Syria as early as 1 Kings chapter 20 and Ben-Hadad. 1 Kings chapter 20 and Ben-Hadad, King Ben-Hadad. This goes back very early in Israel's history. My, is it warm in here tonight. It's warm everywhere tonight. Just like 1 Kings 14, not quite as early, of course, because we're talking about six chapters later, but very early in the history, just like with Shishak, that Israel may actually have been scattered into Syria um, by Ben-Hadad when he came and, and took part of the northern kingdom and perhaps carried captives back with him. Uh, we know that they're brought here during the rule of the Seleucids. We're not going to really 
uh, turn to or major on that First Kings chapter 20 account. I don't want to take the time to, and it's not going to be that important anyway. Now, Josephus tells us that Syria was the country of the largest Jewish diaspora. Now, this would be from the time of the, for the time of the first century whenever Josephus is writing. Josephus tells us that Syria was the country of the largest Jewish diaspora. And he happened to know a lot about Egypt as well, so we're assuming that he meant a greater Jewish population here in Syria than even down in Egypt. And we saw down in Egypt, uh, we may be talking about one million Jews down there. So we may be talking about 1.5 or 2 million Jews up here in Syria. Not a big surprise. Not a big surprise for them being in Egypt, since both countries, relatively speaking, are bordering countries, one on the south and one on the north of Palestine. But however many, it must mean a multitude. If this, is the, if this holds the largest concentration of Jews, of the diaspora Jews in the Roman world, Whatever the figure, whether it's 1.5 or 2 million or 2.25, it must have been a multitude of Jews. Uh, the two big cities, well, I'm going to move this map even more. My, my, I'm trying to keep Portugal and Spain on over there, and I can't give myself enough room over here. Let's bring it in right here. Would be, uh, let's give ourselves Jerusalem. Uh, the two important cities would be what in Syria? Damascus, Damascus. and Antioch on the Orontes. Remember there's another Antioch up here, so they have to be uh, distinguished, the one from the other. Antioch on the Orontes. Two big cities are Damascus and Antioch. They must have had very large Jewish representation. If you'll open your Bible into the book of Acts, where we'll be a lot tonight, just uh, jumping around at some verses with uh, Paul's life and ministry and particularly some of his travels, uh, we see right off the bat in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. Some of these things are well known, but it's good still to look at them in the context of what we're studying here. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter, against the disciples of the Lord, Acts 9, 1, he's still unconverted at this stage, went unto the high priest in Jerusalem, of course, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, synagogues plural, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Well, of course, we've got several implications here. Number one, we've got a large Jewish constituency in the city of Damascus, large enough for the synagogue to be pluralized as synagogues here. And if you just got well, a few hundred men, I'm sure, and a, a few hundred women, I'm sure they could fit in a synagogue or two. The implication is we're talking about a lot more people here. And of course, then secondly, another derived implication, or maybe uh, more of a derived thought, would be, I thought he was going after Christians, not Jews. So if he's going after Christians, what is he doing going into the synagogues? The Jews who were unbelievers would certainly have thrown the Christians out if you had Jewish Christians there in the synagogue. Well, evidently that must not be true because he's certainly a very well-informed arch enemy and persecutor of the early Christian church in its stage of infancy. And he knows what he's doing, and he's going to the synagogues to find men or women. And that tells us something about the synagogue will make up then, men or women, that he could bring them bound down to Jerusalem. So that brings up some questions that we'll have to get into later, such as what type of, you see, because we're talking about diaspora Jews here. They're outside of, of the confines of Palestine. So what type of control or influence, what type of jurisdiction, maybe is a better word, did the, the, did the Jewish people and the leaders in the great synagogue down here in Jerusalem exert over diaspora Jews? <coughs> I mean, to be able to go and get letters from the high priest here at Jerusalem, travel way, I mean, this is a, like 100 or more miles, I guess maybe 150 miles up to Damascus to bring, just take people out of the synagogue and bring them back. Well, what are they doing in the synagogue to begin with? Wouldn't the local minister of that synagogue know that he shouldn't be having these Jewish Christian believers in his midst? 
So you see, Acts just opens up a lot of interesting things uh, of the contacts and, and the conversation, the discourse, the travel between, the communication between Palestinian Jewry and the Jewry of the diaspora, which is a very important question that we will be getting into later in this study that's dealt with in Acts, a very important question. What type of relationship stood to exist between Palestinian Jewry and diaspora Jewry? Evidently, we're seeing some type of control of, of this worldwide Jewish diaspora by that, by that um, synagogal setup right there in Jerusalem, by the hierarchy, by the Sanhedrin, if you please. And, of course, we know Paul ends up converted as he goes to Damascus. So he travels, we see in the first few verses here, to the Damascene synagogues. Later, he preaches Christ to the Jews which make up these very Damascene synagogues. Verse 20, straightway he preached, uh, probably you should have Jesus, I don't know what the NIV has, but I think that's a better textual reading rather than Christ. Straightway he preached Jesus in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. I'm reading in Acts 9 now down to verse 20. Better reading would be Jesus, a personal name instead of his messianic title. Straightway he preached Jesus in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Now what a remarkable conversion Saul has experienced here. To have gone with the intent of bringing these men and women back to prison in Jerusalem. And he ends up converted, preaching that this one that he didn't believe was anything but a liar and a blasphemer, and he received the death that was justly deserved by him, now he's preaching he's God's son. He's the son of God. Now, he's preaching in the synagogues. Well, he certainly couldn't be preaching to those men and women for which he went in verse 2 because they were believers. They were already Christians. The synagogue must have had uh, at, at least a twofold constituency of Jewish believers and Jewish unbelievers. And Paul's going to preach to the unbelievers now. Uh, skipping down to verse 22. Uh, Saul increased, well, let's, uh, why not skip over 21? I might as well read it. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? And so now we have a little bit of an addition to the last two words in verse 1. High priest, now chief priests, plural. And I think I might have mentioned that earlier. You know, have you ever noticed when you read the New Testament, you don't read that in the Old. There was an high priest. If you prefer A, that's all right. I think it's more correct to put an N on an A if the next word starts with an H. A high priest and high priest in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, all of a sudden we have chief priests, plural. Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus. We're still talking about Damascus here. Proving that this is the Christ. Very, it's not a good word. <laughs> but this is very Christ, like this is very good. This is the Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then his... Uh, disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in the basket. Well-known story in Paul's life here. Then if you look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 32 and 33, last two verses in that chapter, uh, Paul alludes to this experience. Luke gives us some details. Paul gives us other details. They're not contradictory, they're complementary. 2 Corinthians 11, 32. In Damascus, the governor under Eretus, and we've discussed him before, the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. And where was this? In Damascus. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. 
You say, yes, I, I realize all this, but remember what a remarkable difference it is when you read the Old Testament. You wouldn't have Elisha or someone traveling up to Damascus to preach to the Jews there because the Jews were locked in their homeland. They knew this is the promised land. They had land promises given to Abraham. They wouldn't be outside of that territory. You wouldn't think of traveling to Damascus to preach to Jews there. And yet you know whenever you read Acts, that is what you expect then, that Paul and the other apostles and the other early Christians traveled around the world preaching, preaching to Jews in synagogues all over the place. And so that's, of course, why we're discussing it, because of the great diaspora that has happened meanwhile. Josephus tells us that 10,000 Jews, in another reference he says 18,000, I, I don't know which of those is correct, perished during the war just at Damascus, the A.D. 66 to 70 war, the Jewish revolt against Rome. That's either 10 or 18. Probably one of those is a textual corruption, and I don't know which one is, is correct and which one is corrupt. But one place he says 10,000 Jews, and another he says 18,000 Jews. Uh, perished in Damascus during the Jewish revolt. And that's a fairly large number because the revolt was basically centered right in Israel, right in Jerusalem, and that's where the multitudes of Jews were slaughtered by the forces of Titus. So we're 150 miles away, and we've got from 10 to 20,000 Jews being slaughtered here in the city of Damascus. Well, there's Damascus. What about the other important city, Antioch? Well, I think that we hardly have to look for biblical support for the importance of Antioch on the Orontes as an early Jewish Christian stronghold. Uh, Paul starts his first journey from this capital city, Acts 13, verses 1 to 4, um, as he did his second journey, and it really becomes the, the important church right behind Jerusalem, Antioch on the Orontes, Acts 13, 1 to 4. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers. And the Holy Spirit separated Saul and Barnabas to the work of the ministry. So he leaves from this capital city on his first journey. He didn't go with the support, quote, unquote, of the Jerusalem church, but of the Antiochian church. Then chapter 15, uh, verses 35 through 41, he leaves from Antioch on the Orontes on his second journey as well. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus, and we would say goodbye, Barnabas. We don't read more of you in this book. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches or the assemblies. So we've got biblical support in the Lucan narrative of Acts for both of these cities being very important for Jewish strongholds, which then made them very important for early Christian strongholds, because the early Christians were Jews for the most part. We have few exceptions to that. Now, again, we may take note of this fact. There are no references to Paul traveling in Mesopotamia. There are no references to Paul traveling in Egypt. There are no references to letters being written to the latter, and the only question of the former would be 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, which is an issue in itself, which I really don't think fits here. So I'd say there are no letters written to churches in Mesopotamia or in Egypt. But as we're continuing our counterclockwise sweep around the Mediterranean Sea, we increasingly take note of the presence of Jewish synagogues. And that alone, that alone proves an extremely extensive Jewish diaspora in this area, just by virtue of the fact that there are all of these synagogues. The Jews are the people of the book, religiously minded people, and hopefully religiously observant as well. 
And so as we're continuing our counterclockwise sweep, we're finding an increasingly large number of Jewish communities and settlements. And we see numerous settle settlements right here in Syria. All right, let's move on up here to D, to Asia Minor. D, Asia Minor. Uh, it appears like what happened as far as the Jewish population here is that they spread from Syria up into Asia Minor. During the Seleucid rule, sometimes they were actually transplanted by the Seleucids to these, what were for them, the Seleucid rulers, frontier territories because the Jews had somewhat of a stabilizing effect there. Um, we'll say more about that later. In one sense, they're a warring people, but on another sense, they don't want to cause too many problems lest that puts a spotlight back on them and they get in more trouble. So the best thing to do is, if at all possible, keep your mouth zipped closed. And so they were a stabilizing effect here. Uh, Antiochus III, that we discussed before, many, many months, a year or so ago, whenever. Antiochus III was one of the Seleucid leaders who bodily transplanted the Jews from Antioch and Damascus, particularly Antioch, up into the Asia Minor cities. According to Josephus, Antiquities 12.3.2, 12.3.4, So we know from this one reference, as well as some others, how the Jews got up here. And that would put them, you know, back a couple of hundred years B.C. is when we know they're actually spreading up here. And probably they're there earlier as well. But here we have um, a large migration, more or less a forced large migration of the Jewish people from Syria up into Asia Minor. And Tychus III does it according to Josephus in Antiquities 12.3.4. And again, by the time Paul reaches this area, it is filled with Jewish synagogues. <clears throat> this has to be a marvel for anyone who goes from the Old Testament over into the New. The only reason it probably is not as much of a marvel as it should be is because we've already been preconditioned through church and Sunday school materials to expect this that whenever we go from the Old Testament into the New, then we're going into the travels of the Apostle Paul, and he traveled basically preaching, first of all, to the Jews. He thought that the gospel was to the Jew first, and then to the Greek, or then to the Gentile. So we've already been preconditioned to know that there's some type of hiatus between Malachi and Matthew. Now, what that hiatus is, very few people know. That's, that's called ITP class. That's what that hiatus is. Very few people know about that. They simply know we close Malachi, we open Matthew, we're reading a different book. We have a different story here. These Jews that were so big about Bethel and Shechem and you know, Samaria and Jerusalem and Jericho, now we're not reading those cities anymore. All of a sudden we're reading Antioch. And we're reading places like Pamphylia and Cappadocia. I didn't find any of that anywhere in the Old Testament. And a Damascus, we don't find very little of that in the Old Testament. And then before you know it, you're into Corinth and Athens and Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and Macedonia. You don't find that in the Old Testament. So, hence we have the hiatus that I've spoken of earlier. Let's look at a few references uh, for Asia Minor in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13 and verse 14. Acts 13 and verse 14. This territory, Asia Minor, simply filled with Jewish synagogues. Acts 13, 14. Now what happens, of course, on Paul's trip is um, they, they sail from Antioch, uh, they go through the island here, Cyprus, and then they go up here. They go on the new backtrack, and then they come back like that. You can look in the back of your Bible. I'm sure you'll find a map similar to that for Paul's first so-called missionary journey. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. Now, really, they're already up in here by the time they're to Perga. Let's go down to, back up to, um, 
Well, let's see, in verse 4, they leave Antioch and go to Antioch's port, Seleucia. That's the Antiochian port on the Mediterranean. Then they sail over to the island, uh, and they go to Salamis, verse 5, which is on this side of the island. And then they go to, what, Paphos, Paphos in verse 13, which is on this side of the island. And then they should go up to Perga. And Perga is this little, uh, again, another little coastal city right here in Pamphylia. And then from there, they go on up in here to another Antioch, which is to be distinguished from Antioch on the Orontes, one Syrian and one, Syrian and one Asia Minor. Uh, then, verse 14, they departed from Perga. They came to Antioch in Pisidia and went where? Into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And this is Paul's, you know, first great sermon that we have recorded here. And it goes, as you know, way over to the end of this chapter. And, oh, is this going to be an important chapter that we'll have to uh, dissect, especially as we get down into uh, verse 43. We'll have a lot to say about that verse. As well as these verses I'm just going to read. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, then say on. And Paul stood up, took that as his cue, beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. And as his custom was then, he kind of, as Stephen's custom was, and, and Saul evidently heard that in Acts um, chapter 7, he kind of recites some Jewish Old Testament history, how God dealt with, you know, Saul, and, and Saul was a reprobate, and so he took him away and set up David, and David was a man after his own heart. And then John the Baptist comes on the scene uh, preaching down in verse 27, and they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voice of the prophets voices of the prophets which are read every sabbath day they have fulfilled them in condemning him and of course he's already to the messiah now then he goes through his death burial his resurrection which he said is according to the second psalm uh, verse 38 be it known unto you therefore men and brethren that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. And then he goes into um, a fearful Old Testament prophecy here. Beware, therefore, of Habakkuk, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5. He's saying, now here, this prophecy is, is, being, is being fulfilled, that God said he'd do a work that, sh that you wouldn't believe though you saw it. And here you said that you believe your, your Old Testament prophecies that you've been reading all along about this Messiah coming, and I'm here to declare to you that he has come and gone. But yet his, his, the power for the forgiveness of sins is still here present. And of course, uh, they're kind of interested. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, then the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews, little righteous souls as they were, saw the multitudes, they're filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken of Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. And so Paul said, well, I was sent to you, but now we'll fulfill Isaiah's prophecy that we are a light unto the Gentiles. And so verse 48, that passage that no one but a Calvinist likes to read, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Only those who were ordained to eternal life believed. Some of those Jews must not have been ordained. That's why they didn't believe. All right, then what happens? They shook off the dust of their feet against them and came to Iconium. The disciples were filled with joy with the Holy Spirit. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. And so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. So you've got Antioch, and you've got another little city, Iconium, all up here in Asia Minor. And on the other journeys of Paul, of course, he's over here in Ephesus, and he's just all around here. He's always teaching to these people in their synagogues. 
One authority has documented no less than 31 strong Jewish communities in Asia Minor and Cyprus, this island right here. And no doubt many more than that existed, which have simply left no trace down to this day. But one authority has documented no less than 31 strong Jewish communities in Asia Minor and Cyprus. Now, we don't have that many in Acts mentioned. You don't have that many cities covered where we know certainly that there's a synagogue there, there's a Jewish settlement there. 31, I mean, think how many exits you're going to end up with up here and a few on the island of Cyprus. This whole thing would just be dotted full. And that's 31 that he's documented, and as I've said, no doubt many more existed, but we don't have a trace of them today. We don't have inscriptions, or we don't have, you know, some type of remain of their existence there today. So I don't know, 50, 75? Who would know what the top limit would be to put on that of, of Jewish synagogues, of strong Jewish communities all around in this area? Now, now, don't lose out on what I'm saying here because we're going we're gonna to use this to prove some very important things about Christian evangelism, about you and myself today in the here and the now later. I mean, we've got the Old Testament so that the New Testament church can, can learn from its example, and then we've got the New Testament so that the church of the 20th century can learn from the New Testament's example. Everyone learns from those that have come before them. And this is going to be highly significant that we're just going all around here, and there are just Jewish communities everywhere, and synagogues everywhere, and the Jews are everywhere. If nothing else, and it is certainly a lot more, if nothing else, it's a fulfillment of Moses' prediction that if you sin against me, I will scatter you. See, God is as faithful to the curses as to the blessings. He's faithful. He's as faithful to the curses to punish, to discipline disobedience as he is to reward faithfulness. He's just as faithful. He, he's not like the overindulgent American parent. He's as faithful to the curses to punish, to discipline disobedience as he is to reward faithfulness. He's just as faithful. He, he's not like the overindulgent American parent. He's very faithful. If he said something, he's going to do it. If he said, obey me and I'll bless you, disobey me, I'll discipline you, then he'll do not one or the other, but both of those as the occasion demands. Combined total for Jews in Syria and Antioch, maybe two to three million, and maybe four. I mean, this is, it's really guesswork. It's really guesswork. We know there's probably 10 to 15 million Jews in the Roman Empire. But it's guesswork. That's guesswork in itself there. And it's guesswork even more when you start trying to break it down and say, now, I wonder how many was in this city? And how many lived on Strong Street? Or what about Elm Avenue? How many actually lived here? That really goes off the deep end there. Greece. E, Greece. Acts again is our proof of Jewish people settled this far away from their homeland. And notice that we're having to continue to turn further and further in Acts. We're over to chapter 14 now. We've got to keep on turning further and further to keep substantiating or documenting these things. Let's jump to chapter 17, because we have some good references here. 17, 17 and 18 in Acts. Then, of course, 19 is going to take us back here in Asia Minor because it takes us back to um, the city of Artemis, Ephesus. Now, when they had, well, of course, they're already over here because of chapter 16, verse 11, loosing from Troas, which is, uh, where are we? which is right here. Loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi. Samothrace is an island, and I'm still in verse uh, 11, and then Neapolis is the port of uh, Philippi, and Philippi is the city that's a little bit inland. So he's actually over here into Greece into chapter 16. But they get thrown in jail and asked to leave. 
And what's important, of course, as you may already remember about Philippi, is that there is no Jewish synagogue there. Maybe I, maybe I need to backtrack and, and cover that since we're over into Greece now. There is no Jewish synagogue there. Remember uh, verse 13, on the Sabbath day we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. We sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. Now if there would have been a synagogue, that's where he would have gone. When the Sabbath day came, that's exactly where the Apostle Paul could always be found reasoning and arguing and alleging that this Messiah is Jesus Christ and he has come and gone and left us his spirit. He's up in Philippi and he goes out by the river where the women are praying. And of course, he has a little camp meeting of sorts down there. So he's, it's not unsuccessful, his trip to Philippi, but the point is no Jewish synagogue there. And that's going to prove something that I'll say here in a moment. Back into chapter 17 in verse 1. I don't know why I'm going so fast. I'm almost out of material, but I'll get through with this and I'll teach you the second message then. Now, when they had passed through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. So we're just going through a couple of little cities along here until we get to a bigger city, Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Luke never tires of telling us that. It's part of his whole makeup of his entire story. Where was a synagogue of the Jews? And that's what we have to underscore in our mind as we read along here. We don't see Paul going all over the world and trying to find those 90 to 100 million non-Jews, Gentiles out there, to convert. Now, he himself refers to himself as the apostle of the Gentiles. Peter's an apostle of the circumcision. I'm the apostle of the uncircumcision. Well, I don't know so much about that. Peter, the apostle of the circumcision? What's Peter doing writing to Babylon? The church which is elected greeteth thee in Babylon, 1 Peter 5, 13. And what's this business according to the Roman Catholic Church of Peter being the first pope way over there in Rome. Paul, the apostle of the uncircumcision, the uncircumcised. Well, everywhere we find him going, he's going and preaching to Jewish people. So see, you have to think about those things when you read. You just can't take it. Well, now Paul, he went and evangelized the world. Well, specify what, what you're talking about, what part of the world. Be a, more, a little more definite. Be a little more specific. Break it down. Go down that fun a little deeper. He evangelized the world. What part of the world? Only part I'm finding him evangelizing so far are the synagogues, the Jewish people. He's trying to convert these Jews from not really Mosaicism, but Pharisaism over to Christianity. And, of course, he's being very, very successful. He has his ups and downs as far as, uh, quote, success, end of quote, is concerned. Sometimes they throw him out and beat him and so forth. But he's having a lot of success, or I'm sure he would have just given up. But a question that whatever that was that happened to him back in Acts 9, bright lights and voices and too much wine the day before. And Paul, as his manner was, this was his custom. He wasn't doing anything out of the ordinary. It would have been out of the ordinary not to do this. See, I'm, I'm emphasizing that because we're going to return to that later in this study and ask ourselves some questions about that about this apostle uh, of the uncircumcised. That's over in Galatians 2 for a verse for that. Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. Have you ever heard this business before that, that the Jews of the first century misinterpreted the two streams of messianic prophecy in the old testament that they were looking for that second stream of the messiah coming as a reigning king of him coming as a suffering servant well that's a question we need to get into what exactly was the rabbinical idea during the first century a.d everyone in sermons throws that little comparison out and around all the time and I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm just, we need to think about the things that we've been taught or others have said to us and see, do, can we document these things? 
That's what's so good about study is, is you have some type of footing to stand on. Think of how many sermons that you just hear out there. And this man stands up and he says, this is what the Greek says. And I don't, I don't know if that's what the Greek said or not. I guess because I don't trust him, so I don't know. I, I've got to go look it up myself. If he said now, because I've heard um, imbecile Charles Cromley's tapes about now Paul, what he was really preaching against there when he said women don't speak in churches, he was trying to break down the, the Pharisaic legalisms that had carried right over into the church. They were practicing a form of Judaism there. And so he gives this long list. Now, according to Rabbi Rundan, he gives Rabbi Runda's rendition of this, and Rabbi this, and Rabbi that. And he's a duck-billed platypus in his brain, as far as I'm concerned. He doesn't know anything about rabbis. His grandmother's a rabbi. He doesn't know anything about anything when he's quoting all this. All he's trying to prove is that he wants his wife to be able to preach and his daughters to be able to preach. Uh, he wants his wife to run the home. And I've heard him say that. So now, if I get out of line, my wife hits me and puts me right back in line. Har, har, har. And the congregation out there just har, har, har right along with him. That's right. We'll teach these wimpy husband of ours a thing or two. And they say, we've got biblical support because Paul wasn't teaching against women. He was teaching for women. The Pharisees were the ones who taught against women. And he was trying to correct all of that. So you just have all these things thrown out to you like salt and pepper sprinkled on eggs. And you don't know what to receive or what to reject. And even when they try to document it, you can't believe that their documentation they're either quoting strong's or vines one or the other so you really can't rely too much on their documentation opening and alleging that christ must needs have suffered in other words paul is teaching them something about the sufferings of christ that he needed to suffer risen again from the dead that this jesus whom i preach unto you is christ some of them believed and consorted with paul and silas and of the devout greeks a great multitude and of the chief women not a few but the Jews which believed not were moved with envy. And they got Paul thrown out of the city and took a financial pledge or security of Jason that Paul would not come back. And so we have our little, um, as it were, to the sea question in verse 14 that we've thankfully already put under our belt. And we could look at others in chapter 18. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. So you see, he's gone. He's gone the whole route here from Philippi down to Thessalonica, probably down here to Athens, down here to Corinth, and so forth. However, here's a point I want to make under E in Greece. The numbers of Jews in Greece were probably not as great as elsewhere. Were probably not as great as Asia Minor, Syria, Egypt. Why? There were fewer Roman colonies. And it appears as though the Jews thrived and prospered more while under Roman contract and rule rather than Greek. Not as many Roman colonies. Of course, Rome comes on the scene right after Greece and conquers Greece. But... Greece, I mean, so much of Greece still remains Greece, though. Rome, Rome exerts her influence through Greece, but when you just conquered the nation that was controlling these nations, it's easier to circle around and put your influence all out here. And then you've got a measure of your influence here in this country that you've conquered that control these, but you've got more of your influence in these countries that were controlled by your predecessor. So there are not as many Roman colonies here. There's not as many Roman people living here. The influence of Rome is not exerted as strongly here as elsewhere. And it seems as though the Jews prospered more under Roman rule than under Greek. And I don't know exactly why that's true. And I haven't found anyone else that's really discussed that in any detail, why exactly that's true. We can hypothesize a while, but let's move on. I do have a few more things I want to share before, before we stop here. Uh, still under Greece, uh, let me just mention a few cities here. Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth were the major cities for Jewish settlement. That's Acts 17 and 18. Thessalonica, Berea, that's in uh, 17... 
10, B-E-R-E-A, or B-E-R-O-E-A, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth were the major cities. Now again, if you're familiar with Acts, sorry I've ended up with so much chicken scratch up here, but you know Paul is doing all traveling all around here. All different types of cities are mentioned. You think of Greece, what cities are, are mentioned there where he, where, where he really goes and teaches? We see in 17.1 he passes through Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue. The implication is there was no synagogue in Amphipolis and Apollonia, which would mean there's not a large Jewish population there. We've already, di we've already discovered from chapter 16 there's not a large Jewish population in Philippi because there's no synagogue. Jews equal synagogue. Synagogue equals Jews. If there are Jews, there will be a synagogue. There's not in Philippi. There's not in Amphipolis. There's not in Apollonia. We have to get down here to Thessalonica and then its sister city, which is just nearby Berea, Athens, and Corinth. Only four places. Now, of course, most of this is mountainous over here, so he doesn't settle. He doesn't travel a lot over here, except maybe into um, Yugoslavia, Illyricum, which is mentioned over in in um, Romans chapter 15. But that's not that important right now anyway. That was probably done later in his ministry. Okay, if we've got that, let's go to, we've only got two more to do. F, Italy. Fewer in Greece, though. Just kind of remember that. Fewer in Greece. And you think only a couple of chapters and only four cities really mentioned. Contrary to all that we know that's taking place in Syria and Asia Minor and from other sources in Egypt. Okay, let's talk about Italy for a moment. Outside of the capital city of Rome, very few Jews lived in Italy. Inside the city was another matter. We have much evidence for a large Jewish settlement in Rome. I think that primarily this was due to Pompey's capture of Jerusalem and Judea in 63 B.C. Pompey, P-O-M-P-E-Y. Pompey's capture of Jerusalem and Judea in 63 B.C., at which time he took many thousands of Jewish captives back to Rome. They were supposed to be part of his triumphal entry into the city, sealing the fact that he was a successful general in war. That's probably how so many Jews got back to the capital city. Now, of course, they were taken back as slaves. So many of these Jews in Rome would have been slaves. They were taken back as, as captives of war, taken back as slaves. But they were later given their freedom. And why, we don't know. It's another one of those historical things that no one knows. Why all of these Jews were given their freedom. They were taken back as slaves. There's no question about that. But the consensus of opinion here is that they were released from their slavery later. The reason for that, we simply do not know. There were seven to 13 synagogues in Rome. Seven to 13 synagogues in Rome. With maybe several hundred thousand Jews living here. Let's give ourselves a little <clears throat> evidence for this. Maybe 100 to 200,000 Jews. In other words, as we're getting away from Palestine, we're not finding as many Jews. We find so many down here in Egypt and Syria and Antioch. Fewer in Greece, fewer in Italy. <laughs> Acts 28, 17 to 31. Now, this is a reference I gave you. Oh, I don't know. I don't see it now. Must have been a, a number of weeks ago. Oh, well. I gave it to you and said we, 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 we would not read it then. We would return to it, which is what we're doing now. Acts 28, uh, 17 to 31. Came to pass that after Paul's in Rome now, that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. 
So there's Jews in Rome. There are Jews in Rome. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal to Caesar. Remember, he said, I appeal to Caesar. And the magistrate said, If you've appealed unto Caesar, then unto Caesar you shall go. Not that I had aught to accuse my nation of, for this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And here's what the Jews said to him. A little, little questionable exactly what, uh, what they really did say or what, or what Luke means by what he records. We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. It's a little strange that all the ire that was raised in Palestine over Paul and his ministry, with all of that as a background, that they, the, the leaders of, of Jewry in Palestine have not alerted the Jews here in the Roman capital against the apostle Paul. That's rather striking if that's true, if these Jews aren't lying here. Uh, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Now, what sect do you think he's talking about here? The believers, the Christians, is everywhere spoken against. Now, you contrast that with what the world thinks of the church today. It's everywhere spoken in favor of, spoken against everywhere. They had appointed him a day, and they came to his lodging. He expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuaded them concerning Jesus out of the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. Some believed, and some did not. And so those that didn't, he turned Isaiah's prophecy loose on them. He said, you, the heart of you people has waxed gross, and your ears are dull of hearing, your eyes you've closed. And it's impossible for you to be saved, but be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And that made the Jews mad, I'm sure. And then we, what about the book of Romans itself? We're looking for evidence in the New Testament for a Jewish population here in Rome. Well, I would list such chapters as um, 2 and 3 and four, if you've got Romans, just watch these verses here. 2.17, Behold, thou art called a Jew. And he's writing to the church, remember, the assembly of saints in Rome. Verse 7, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, call saints. Romans 1.7. He's writing to the assembly in Rome. What is its makeup? It must have been partially Jewish. Behold, thou art called a Jew. And he goes on about the law. And then chapter 3, verse 1, what advantage then hath the Jew? Chapter 4, he gives this long comparison of Abraham. Now, is it Abraham in works or Abraham in faith? Well, it wouldn't make any sense one way or the other for a Gentile. He's never heard of Abraham. He's never, he doesn't own the Old Testament, so he doesn't know anything about Abraham. Now, give him something about Zeus or Apollo, and then he'll know what you're talking about. But Abraham, what God would that be? So he's not writing to Gentiles there, except Gentiles who, through their contact with Jewish Christianity, have come to be acquainted with the Old Testament. So you have to look for little things like this. If he's spending so much time on Abraham, he's writing to Jewish people here. Now, don't take that as a blanket statement. There are Gentiles here in the church as well, but part of the church has to be made up of Jews. And then chapters 9, 10, and 11. I list those two sections of six chapters, 2, 3, and 4, 9, 10, and 11. And so that leaves you with 1, and then 5 through 8, and then 12 through 16, that must be speaking to Gentiles. Well, you, I don't have to read too much here. You know what he's dealing with. All about the Jews, and they've been forsaken. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to, to God is that Israel be saved. And... Um, 
chapter 11 as God cast away his people God forbid I am an Israelite great section here in Romans on election chapters 9 10 and 11 clue us in to the fact that Paul is writing to Roman Jews and then finally I think I'll end here so we'll be through with three parts of the land of the diaspora you'll know where they are now would be way over here in Spain we only have one biblical reference we've got many references let me qualify let me take that back we have some references in the early church fathers writings of Romans 15 24 actually being fulfilled although we don't have it said in so many words in the New Testament and that of course is Paul's desire to travel to Spain Romans 15:24. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I hope to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thither, thithered, or, thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. And he speaks of the offering that has been given by the Greek churches down into verse 28 again. He'll speak of Spain. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. Seems like what at least one purpose in Paul writing Romans is to um, he has he hasn't been here before. This is prior to, to Acts chapter 28. So w what he knows about the people in this list of I greet, I greet, I greet and say hello to in chapter 16 tells us he does know a lot of the people there, but he might have known some of them like Aquila and Priscilla from other places such as Corinth and Ephesus since we find those two people in both of those places. He's wanting to use it as a beachhead. You know, he's wanting to use it as a beachhead. He writes Romans in preparation for traveling. He said, I want to come to Spain through you. I want to come by you into Spain. He's got to have some beachhead. Whenever he travels out here, he uses Antioch as his springboard. When you're this far away, you've got to have some other contact, resources, financial help to go over there and do that, men to travel with you. And so he seems to want to use his great church in Rome, Italy, as his springboard to get over into Spain. Now, here would be my conclusion about Spain then. It seems to be Paul's practice that he travels only where he can find Jewish synagogues. You see, you give me a reference that's contrary to that in the New Testament and you won't find one. So what would our conclusion be then? There must be synagogues in Spain. See how easy and fun it is to study the Bible? You just have to think about these things a little bit. Paul's custom is to only travel where he can find Jewish synagogues. If he travels to Spain, that must mean he's expecting for Spain to be the home of Jewish people. And I would end this part of our study with this statement. It's so long, I'm sure you can get it down. <laughs> Truly, it was a great diaspora. From this little old city of earthly Zion here all the way to Spain and Portugal. And the other direction all the way into Babylon, Media, Elam, Assyria. And by extension and maybe by an inference all the way to India and all the way up to England. The Jews have been scattered. Truly, it was a great diaspora. <laughs>